Good morning. Uh, happy to be here. I am a demographer. A, a lot of research in this area, of course, is done by social scientists, but usually when I study STEM, I look at core STEM and I exclude the social sciences. Um, as a demographer, my particular interest is on primarily labor markets, uh, primarily immigrants in labor markets. And as I started looking at highly skilled migration for a number of reasons, including very controversial issues like brain strain, which is what I call it, but brain drain and those types of things, I naturally became much more interested in STEM over time, which is where most highly skilled migrants are involved. Um, and then, of course, in my other interest, which is the educational system. And when we were looking at these debates, my colleague and myself, uh, Hal Salzman and myself, um, we noted, like many other folks, that there was a lot of, um, I think, what we're going to say has been around for a long time, of course. Uh, I've run across um, quotes from 1900 about how we need more science uh, in the United States at a time when about 8% of the population was completing high school. So it's not at all a new issue. Uh, but in terms of immigration, there's a lot of hyperbole, and, and we wanted to start looking at some of the claims. And you'll know, of course, that the National Academy of Sciences just recently released an update on its rising storm report, and the rising storm report was one of the things that kind of impelled us to look at some more data. And um, the recent report says we're now in a gale five uh, force hurricane, and, uh, and some of the data includes factums like we spend more on potato chips in the United States than R&D and things like that. Um, And it's not really an easy nut to crack, as far as I can tell. There's a lot of slip between some of these things that seem fairly obvious. Let me go through some fairly obvious things. One of the obvious things that people talk about is educational performance is in decline, that the pipeline is leaking, and that we're facing a crisis. Since I've got 10 minutes, I'm going to skate through some things pretty quickly, uh, also because, well, some of the data I'm showing here is not strictly speaking from the six longitudinal databases that we ginned up to, to do the report that Kenan's talking about, but, but also because um, I've used a lot of other different databases to kind of get at some of these issues. One of the things, of course, is the number of STEM graduates over time, uh, and this is not the most recent data, has continued to, to increase at all levels, the doctorate level being the less. Now, least in terms of numbers, but even those numbers kind of went up a little bit in recent years. Again, this is core STEM. I take us social scientists out. Um, how about in terms of interest? So what this is, is they ask, in, they ask incoming freshmen or outgoing high school graduates, um, do you want to go into science and engineering? And then we, I looked at uh, the proportion about five years later. Uh, who end up actually getting a bachelor's degree in STEM. And except for a dip when, the, <clears throat> well, you can see a, a rise in the post-Sputnik era. And you can see the same thing with master's and PhD degrees. If you look at the yield from bachelor's a few years later to, to master's and PhDs. And the point here is, is that except for this Sputnik spike and a decline in the 60s when everybody was kind of, I guess, worried about the man, I don't know who Y'all that were there, I mean, I was there in the 60s. I don't know why interest waned, but it did. Um, but output then after that slowly increases. So in fact, I don't see any in this kind of data in terms of expressed interest and express progression to graduation, any decline in interest in STEM per se. And this is STEM broadly. Now, is that a problem? Most of the people who criticize what we do here say, well, you can't talk about STEM. Let's talk about financial engineering or some particular sub-discipline where there's clear shortages, and that's the critique. And it's not an irrelevant critique, but it, I think of, again, since I'm interested in kind of the global labor market, I'm always fascinated what's happening in China and India. And India has increased its output of engineers from, you know, tens of thousands to literally, you know, hundreds of thousands over the course of a decade, and it shifted its model completely from, you know, mechanical to electrical engineering to meet, meet IT demands abroad in the course of a couple of years. So the, the point simply is, is that it is at least feasible to think of people with generic skills and interests in 
basically mathematical application of various kinds of scientific issues, that they might shift to where demand is, if this is a question of supply and demand. So I think while STEM does put too much together, it's not a completely irrelevant thing to think about. Uh, and that's, of course, how I think about labor markets. You know, shoot me because I work with economists a lot. So um, this is just looking at degree output at different levels. Um, and these are just uh, citizens, uh, not, uh, not including new, newly arrived immigrants. And the numbers are, uh, in terms of shares and in terms of raw numbers, don't show, actually, remarkably, a lot of change over time. So once again, where's the argument that there's been a lot of drop in or declining interest, or that the numbers have actually dropped markedly, and they, and they haven't. Has performance declined? Another part of the pipeline. And there's a claim that, you know, students just aren't doing well on math, et cetera, et cetera, or that we're not teaching enough. And if you look at public high school students, uh, at least over this prior decade, uh, not <laughs> during the 90s, um, the number of students who are actually getting, you know, AP type courses and whatnot goes up. Now we could all talk about what does AP mean and that set of issues, but in fact, on a number of benchmarks, uh, say for example, SAT math scores, uh, you can see, you know, pretty marked improvement over time. So I think in terms of what the high schools are actually doing, in terms of education, in terms of performance, we see increase. Now, uh, if you follow this stuff, uh, the more recent uh, NAEP math scores have kind of flattened, but uh, among 13-year-olds, not particularly as much. So when we look at actually quality of outputs and inputs uh, up to the high school level, we can't see what is going on, and of course, much of the complaint, <clears throat> and this is something I get constantly in dis debates about migration, is we do lousy on international tests, so we have to have more immigrants. And I'm, I'm, there's so many logic, logical points in between that that statement that I'm not sure what's going on. But what do these international tests mean? What does the Tims, uh, for example, mean? And if you read the reports, they'll actually say things like, you shouldn't use these scores for international comparisons, which they then immediately start to do. Um, and why would they say that? They say that because the samples are so markedly different. If you look at high school students or uh, young 15-year-olds, depending on the test, uh, in other countries, especially, say, in Europe, you know that they have tracking systems, and those Folks taking the tests are tracked very differently. If you look at the average, um, the age, on age grade data, you know, in the United States, we're talking about large percentages of the students are, you know, older than their actually stated grades. They're, they're not keeping up with the grade that they're being tested for. Uh, so there's a lot of problems in that. Uh, but the other thing, of course, is the tests themselves, where they do these rankings. And I work a lot with indexes, and I love indexes because, you know, I, I get grants to produce them and whatnot. But they're also kind of meaningless. And why are they meaningless? Because you don't know what it means to be 100th or, you know, 90th. I mean, what's the difference between ranking scores and an index? So what um, this is a, by Bo and Stan, what they do is they look at a number of these international tests and kind of average them together, and they look at the statistical significance between rankings, and they find that there's really no difference in performance. In fact, what they claim is that you can rank into three kind of broad um, niches the, uh, the scores on international tests, and if you do that, it turns out that, yeah, it's true the United States does not rank really among the highest on international tests of students, but on the other hand, they kind of rank in the middle, and there's not that many students or many countries with students who rank better. Um, and I think that's kind of the bottom line. The other thing that's, of course, true is if you take, as they did in the last round of the TIMS, and look at Massachusetts separately as a country, and you have to do this with special sampling kinds of approaches, Massachusetts does better than Singapore and a lot of these other countries that supposedly outrank the United States. So the international scores are at least questionable in terms of what they actually mean. And the thing we all know 
is that it's minority performance in the United States that really drags down scores. So if you look at the scores of white students in the United States on their national tests, they rank pretty well, very well indeed. Um, is college production going down? Well, if it's going down, the enrollment seems to be a drop primarily, and you can see it in other data, in white males. So where are the white males going, one might ask. And I don't think we know, precisely. All we know is the usual things we all hear. They're going into business, they're going into law, they're going into some other sets of applications. And, and I've never really, well, that makes sense. I've never really seen the data that demonstrates that that's the case. Uh, we know that college enrollment rates are going down a little bit for some young men. Um, if we look at the relationship um, between the growth of the STEM labor force and kind of its linear past, what we can see is that the late 1990s was more of an aberration than the normal. And in fact, even in recent years, and if you would continue this on out till today, you would see kind of a slowing or a stalling of STEM labor force growth. So is it this surging ahead kind of phenomenon? Remember, STEM is only about 5% of the total US labor force. So as the, the recent rising report, storm, <coughs> rising uh, storm report points out, 5% of the labor force produces everything that the rest of us live on. And, and that's, that's, it says it very you know, baldly that way. And of course, I come from a family that has a medical background, and they're always quick to tell me that every, they save everybody, nobody else does anything. So <laughs> anyway, but it's true, of course, in many ways, that that 5% of the labor force is extremely important, but it's only 5%. It hasn't been growing that much. Let's skip this one. Uh, this one we've already seen. It's this attrition problem. Where do they go? And basically, at each level, from high school to college to graduate, oh, there's a big attrition out. So essentially, in the United States, there's about 15 million, this is really bald figures, roughly 15 million people with some kind of STEM training in their most recent degree, and about 5 million in the STEM labor force. Well, that's a completely imperfect comparison for a lot of reasons. Um, I've done some research with the 2003 National Survey of College Graduates, and what I do is I take STEM graduates, and then I look at those who move into a STEM occupation, those who move into a medical field, which is not formally STEM, uh, and then those who move into STEM management, and then those who move into something they say is a job that is closely related to their training. And if you take all those four aspects of, I'm using STEM in some reasonable way in my actual job, about 80% is actually employed in a STEM-related type of position right out of, right out of uh, college. But then that declines fairly steeply, and it declines much more steeply over their, their career than it does for, say, lawyers or people in the medical field where there's not a lot of career attrition over time. So something's going on both in terms of immediate employment and then over time. And, and I'm not sure I know exactly what's going on. So, but the attrition argument is, you, know, you can kind of see that so far what, what we conclude, my, my colleague and myself, is that in terms of the pipeline, it's hard to see that it's broken all the way from high school up to college. Can things be improved always? Of course. Um, and that in terms of actual supply of this 5% of the labor force, that we're producing a lot of people who seem to be STEM ready. Are there too few immigrants? I'll just roll through my two cents on this. If you look at this as something you've probably seen, depending on the database, the percentages are higher. But we started admitting a lot of immigrants, I'm gonna save you those slides, uh, particularly in the 80s and 90s, who were highly skilled in STEM. And of course, that then has its residue in the population later on. The flow kind of comes into the stock. And it turns out that close to half of PhDs in their mid-40s and younger are foreign-born. Half of economists are foreign-born. Uh, half of PhDs uh, in uh, phys uh, physics are foreign-born. So, the reason this share is so much lower out here is because we didn't admit that many migrants. It's not as if, again, 
remember the STEM labor market is exploding during this period. It's really growing rapidly, specifically in which field? Information technology is the biggest growing field in STEM. Uh, and so we've been, in fact, admitting a lot of foreign born. It doesn't mean anything except we have been. Uh, and of course, we know that the share of the foreign born in certain kind of occupations is very high. Remember the foreign born only about 15% of the labor market overall. So when we hear things like immigrants do jobs nobody else wants to do, we're usually thinking of agriculture or meat packing where the shares are about this high and no higher. So anyway, it's an, an interesting comparison. We also are worried about the international competitiveness of the United States going forward. The United States has about two-thirds of all highly skilled migrants who move around the globe. And that's been steady for about 20 years, and I think the data will should suggest even over the last decades, it's remained pretty much the case. So will we lose international competitiveness? Yes, the United States share of the international uh, foreign student labor markets declined from 25 to 20 percent over the last decade, but the number of foreign students in the United States has increased from 500 to 600,000. So for us to re retain market share, and that's how that business puts it, market share of the international student labor market, you can just imagine what the numbers would have to be. I think that raises the question, can our U.S. institutions absorb that many. One of the things in the background, too, since you in this room, I think, are much more familiar probably with education policy and uh, STEM labor market type of policies, just to put a buzz in here, this is how Congress is thinking about addressing the immigration issues. Uh, the last major legislation in 2006 and 2007 and the current debate and furor over immigration is all about comprehensive reform. We do need to do something about the large population, about 11 million, unauthorized in the United States today. But behind the scenes and less remarked upon are market changes in skilled migration policy. So the 2006 bill would have increased the cap on skilled migrants in STEM five-fold. I was kind of interested what that implied, just doing some simple demographic projections, about what that could imply for the number of um, new immigrants coming in at those proposed levels. And the number, of, as you can see, is about five times greater, not surprisingly. Ultimately, what I end up concluding is that if we were to admit migrants at today's current levels, we would meet what Bureau of Labor Statistics projects as future STEM demand without any increase in the numbers of migrants that we admitted. And furthermore, interestingly enough, um, we would also see an increase from 18 to 24 percent of the immigrant share of the STEM labor force, which is all to say that I think we probably met plenty of migrants by BLS projections. That said, I'm done.